One of the most common phrases you'll hear when professional players give advice to newer players is that more stuff usually beats less stuff. There's obviously technicalities and exceptions to this. It's a massive oversimplification of a vastly complex game, but especially at the lower levels, just being able to consistently make more than your opponent is usually more than enough to carry you through the ranks. However, uh, one thing that's kind of vital to making those large armies is supply. You can be the greatest player of all time who knows everything that the game has to offer, but if you don't increase your supply, you're not making a big army. So, although this comparison is kind of null because obviously this isn't some hyper-competitive high-ranked 1v1 with lots of stakes, one thing I was really curious about was whether or not you can actually beat the StarCraft II campaigns without increasing your supply. So today, I'm here to ask and answer that very question. One campaign per video though, because god, this would be way, way too long if it was just one, and I'm the guy who made this. So uh, I do have to include a few disclaimers before we get in, and don't you worry I'm only going to do this once, but the more realistic titles for this series would be can you beat Wings Liberty without building supply depots or command centers? Can you beat Heart of the Swarm without morphing overlords or hatcheries? And can you beat Legacy of the Void, exclusively the main campaign by the way, without building pylons, nexuses, or using the deploy pylons slash warp and reinforcements abilities in like 800 different caveats? Oh yeah, I forgot to mention these are all on Brutal, too. But ignoring the fact that those are all awful titles and can't even fit in YouTube's title limit, this one is much more concise and I think it's just very appealing to look at. If you're looking for loopholes so you can leave a passive-aggressive comment down below to fuel your fragile ego, let me help you out real quick. Sometimes when you start up a mission, you'll start off with a segment where you don't have a base. And after a certain threshold is met, Ta-da, you now have an entirely brand new base that you didn't have control of previously. However, if you're somebody who considers going to the grocery store by yourself a fun time out, this is gaining additional supply. So for extremely blatant reasons, in-game events that increase our supply won't count against us. However, there are a few missions in which there are events that you can potentially skip that give you supply. For example, on the second mission of Wings of Liberty, you can rescue some rebels who, rather conveniently, have two supply depots with them. And for the most part, I'm going to avoid these whenever possible. But for total transparency on the mission and upgrades, here's every single ruling on everything across all three campaigns. Feel free to pause if you want. Although I think these choices are pretty uncontroversial and I'd struggle to imagine anybody getting really upset with them. Anyways, with the preamble out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into Wings of Liberty. On the first mission, I miraculously managed to lose because I wanted to see if I could beat this Deathless, and after one good old college try, I decided that was good enough for me. But for an actual start on this campaign misadventure, we do actually luck out pretty nicely here. Is probably what I would say if I didn't go back to retry the mission and see if I can beat it without ever rescuing the mercenaries. Firstly, yes this was added in editing, I forgot to mention this, but I believe this is the one mission in which you get a pop-up if you don't make supply, and it is so fantastically passive-aggressive. The fact that the adjutant just doesn't casually remind you what a supply depot is and instead opts into sending a fucking specialized dropship with one SCV with a permanent pop-up over its head reminding you that you should use it to build a supply depot, it's perfect. It is so bizarre and I love it. And I think the worst part is you don't actually see this guy if you go the mercenary route. Because for whatever reason, the game considers you rescuing the mercenaries as building supply depots oddly. So, 
Despite how incredible this is and how much I really love this, sadly the SCV isn't going to be long for this world as I need barracks units. Anyways, uh, back on topic. Yeah, the difference in effort between trying this with 19 supply and 35 is completely night and day. Assuming you have pretty much any SCVs mining at home, that's at least double the available army supply that you can field. Which if I had to be honest, anecdotally almost feels like three times in its own weird sense. Anyways, for this I needed to abuse buildings extremely heavily. And I'll discuss this way more in depth specifically when we get to smash and grab, but for right now, the main thing we're trying to do is save up and take the best trades possible. And to do that, we're going to abuse deranged enemy AI. More specifically, their interactions with non-hostile buildings. Again, I'm going to go way more in depth for this later, but for this mission, we needed to assure that we had a bank saved up. Because when we move out, we're not going to keep SCVs mining. It's all or nothing. So once we have a decent amount saved, we need to start doing this mission in checkpoints. Firstly, if we don't rescue the rebel group, this cave right here will continuously spawn marines. So we need to assure that we are always in front of it and can never pull those marines. Which fortunately for us, the rebel group actually has enough firepower and medics that they'll always kill them with no losses so we don't have to worry about them marching towards our base, luckily. However, once we reach this checkpoint, this is an absolute fucking nightmare, because we need to not only kill the bunker, but we also need to burst it down ASAP before the Dominion SCVs come to repair it, but we need to also be able to take down the attack wave that is sent out to reinforce the bunker and the base, but we also need to deal with the standard attack wave afterwards. So this required a ton of timing and reloading on my end because with even one of these steps failed, we're doomed. We're not going to recover, we're all in. We did have a decent bank before starting this, but at this point, we're all in. We have absolutely nothing left. So this took a while, but luckily once we did, we can abuse this area right here to spawn camp everything. Because, yes, one of the steps in this was to make a ton of barracks specifically to just land them in the enemy base to be a nuisance. And here's the reason why. So, obviously we're killing all the barracks units that come out, but specifically with the CC and the factory, whenever the command center makes an SCV, for whatever reason it is infatuated with trying to repair the damage, which it obviously can't, and the Hellions get sent out one at a time rather than in a group, which doesn't really do anything because they can't capitalize on their splash damage, and once we got into this position, it was GG. For the next mission, Zero Hour, if you watched any of my Wings Liberty challenges or have really watched any Wings Liberty challenges, you should know why this mission is so easy. There is essentially a 100% guaranteed way to beat this mission, regardless of your performance and regardless of the difficulty that you're playing on. But there is a requirement. So, uh, come here, this is going to be really complex, okay? What you have to do is ensure that by the final waves, you have structures that you can lift off. Oh. Yeah, you literally start off with this requirement. Alright, so let me explain this real quick. So there are two units that deserve to poison this mission that can attack air. Mutas and Hydras. And there are a ton of dead zones throughout the map where you can ensure that the Hydralisks cannot attack your buildings if you choose to lift them off. Which leaves only the Mutalisks, which don't really do a whole lot of damage. The one and pretty much only thing that you have to account for is the fact that their attacks do ricochet, so just don't clump all of your structures on top of each other. Other than that though, since the defeat condition on this mission is to lose all of your structures... Good job. You did it. Woo. So now we have access to the Hyperion. So to clarify one thing out of the gate, we are going to be talking about upgrades and routing a bit more than usual in this playthrough, 
As by the end, almost every single mission becomes mandatory, and likewise there are a bunch of missions that are strictly impossible until a certain power spike. So this is definitely a lot more of a deliberate playthrough. However, for the time being, I don't really have a whole lot to comment on because the upgrade choices are generally, do you want Marine to have more health, or do you want Marauder to have more health? Maybe you want Bunker to have more health. There's not really a whole lot to comment on. But every time I start a mission, I will display the upgrades I got in the top of the screen, just so there's no confusion. First off, we're starting with Smash and Grab. Firstly, because currently the evacuation is entirely impossible, and secondly, we can cheese Smash and Grab. So this is definitely a cheese you've seen time and time again if you've watched my other videos. However, this time there is a very big wrench thrown in there in the form of, predictably, supply. You see, usually how this cheese works is you fly over a barracks by the last objective, train up a ton of marauders, and if you choose to do so, you can use your command center the entire time. Utilizing the pick up and drop SEVs button, you can get the last research, or alternatively, you can fly all the way to the last objective to build up bunkers by the last objective, and that will help you with your fight immensely. However, this doesn't really work here, because not only can we not produce a second command center, but we also can't train a bunch of marauders very easily since we have a maximum supply of 27. Which, if you have 9 workers at home, gives you 18 supply. And obviously you need to get the resources for that army, which means you need to keep the SCVs alive. Which is terrible because that means you need to have forces that defend your SCVs. And likewise, the forces aren't very expendable, as you need to keep your supply depots alive in order to make marauders. And in order to get the marauders up, you need to have the resources for it, which means you need to have SCVs, which means you need to defend them, which means you need to spend supply in order to defend them, which... Yeah. So, basically, this is going to be the start of our new trend, Tactical Procrastination. Because when we choose to get to the last objective, we need to ensure that we can beat the mission without any half measures. So for that, we needed to use an extremely economical defense that we could sustain with minimal losses. So for that, we used engineering bays and bunkers. You're going to be seeing NG bays a ton in this challenge, and that's for a bunch of reasons. Firstly, I believe they are the cheapest mineral per hit point structure in the entire game, barring any structures that require Vesping gas, obviously. But more importantly, they make enemy attack waves significantly less threatening. Basically, let's just say for example you have an engineering bay, and then a bunker. So what ranged units would probably do if they were controlled by a human, is target fire down the NG bay, then just collapse on the bunker and kill it. The AI does not do this. Instead, if there is a non-hostile structure in the way of the bunker, they will ignore it in favor of trying to kill the bunker. Which usually only means that there's going to be two or three units attacking the bunker because also, for whatever reason, the ranged units don't move up to the NG bay and then target fire it down to get off as much DPS as possible, they target it from max range, which is really fucking stupid, and it helps us immensely. But there's another reason why this is extremely helpful for us in Wings of Liberty in particular. Bunkers, firstly, are bunkers and allow you to fire at the enemy unhindered regardless of terrain or whatnot. Secondly, is the upgrades you can get for both the bunker and for the units you can put in the bunker, and thirdly, and by far most importantly for now, bunkers are essentially free to us. So unlike the multiplayer and various patches, salvage restores 100% of the minerals you spent on it. Not 50, not 75%, 100%. So what you can actually do is skip out on repairing the bunker entirely in favor of just getting all of your units out of it and salvaging it at the last second. 
then you're able to just build an entirely brand new bunker with max health at absolutely no cost. And when combined with the NG bays, oh, is this annoying? Absolutely. Is it practical to do in your standard playthrough? Absolutely not. Is it practical and immensely helpful for me? Absolutely. So with the strategy in mind, we were able to save up a ton of resources to get a decent amount of marauders and medics at the very end of the mission, and then we flew over our starting CC to pick up the Protoss research available throughout the map, then loop it back to the last objective just in time for SCVs to repair the CC, build bunkers, and completely decimate the last objective with minimal losses. Afterwards, we gain access to mercenaries, which will be vital throughout the entire run, and I am just so, so happy to say that. I've never gotten a chance to use them in any challenge run, and in this one, they are going to be absolutely perfect. So, basically, mercenaries are units that you can call in about one to three times per mission that are vastly stronger than their usual counterparts, but come in very small squads, have a pretty hefty cooldown in calling down, usually cost a little bit more, and obviously require you to invest into them. Both in the mercenary cost and usually in the actual unit upgrades. So, here's the thing. With our naturally extremely low supply count, maximizing the potential of the few units we can field is going to be extremely important. And as sad as it is to say, since our supply is so limited, when we call down the squads, that's our army. That's not just a part of our army, that's the entire army. So when you look at a bonus like plus 65% health and plus 35% damage, or plus 33% health and plus 66% damage, it is without hyperbole to say that the difference in using mercenaries and not using mercenaries is literally twofold. So they will be utilized to their fullest extent in this run, and I am again so, so happy to say that. I love them all so much. Anyways, on to the next mission. This is one that, again, won't really need a whole lot of explanation. We gotta get 8,000 minerals for Mr. Tosh. And the entire thematic of this mission is that you have to play through it very economically. Not just ensuring that your SCVs can mine safely, but ensuring there isn't unnecessary losses in ensuring their safety. Both in the massive fuck-off lava surges and in the defensive forces you spare to protect them. However, this is definitely a mission that the more you play, the more you can just completely decimate it. And that's for a fair few reasons, such as the general lack of intimidation from the attack waves or even the Zerg bases at all. It is extremely easy to just kill them off entirely, but more specifically for this video, there are a ton of free minerals and free units hidden throughout the map. And really, once you know where they're hidden and where all the resources are, there isn't really a whole lot stopping you from just running them all over the place, getting a whole bunch of free units, getting all the minerals in the world, and winning pretty much instantly. I mean, hell. Not even the bonus objective is spared from this, as it is painfully easy to kite it... forever. And if you want to be really fancy even, you can directly kite it into a lava surge and boil it alive, but... That's not even close to necessary, as 3-4 to four Reapers is more than enough to eventually take it down. So, yeah. Turns out Reapers are pretty good. Afterwards, we gain access to the Shrike Turret, which is going to make the next mission actually possible. We're going to go ahead and do the evacuation, and this is going to be our first major roadblock. Because with a grand total of 19 supply to our name, on a mission that always takes at least 20 minutes to beat with scaling forces, yeah, this is going to be a massive struggle. So to go ahead and beat this mission, we need to play through it extremely economically, and to optimize the early game as much as we possibly can. 
And before we even really start the mission, there are two optimizations that we need to do. And I really do mean need to do, I'm pretty sure they are practically mandatory. So firstly, before we gain control of our base, we need to go ahead and pick up all the resources that are hidden throughout this section. Some of these are pretty blatant, and I'm going to imagine most people could find, and some of these are so hidden that I still get comments to this day from people who never knew they existed. Secondly, and much more bizarrely, what we actually want to do is to just go AFK. And the reason for this is that when you gain control of your base, the time that you spent in this section actually counts towards the initial mercenary cooldowns in the Merc compound. And in doing this, we can actually go ahead and start the mission with War Pigs and Hammer Securities, both of which are obviously extremely good for what we're doing. But uh, with the starting SCVs and the Fire Bats that we started with, we need to go ahead and clear up supply. And this is where we really needed to optimize. Because what we need to ensure is that the first two to three convoys are protected with no casualties. But the issue that arises here is that we also need to assure that this force is extremely small. Because for the fourth and fifth convoy, we need to have resources for that. And trust me, it is extremely easy to run out of steam if you only have up to five active workers. And delaying the mission isn't going to be a viable strategy here. The last waves are strong enough that even with our early game optimized, we're pretty much inevitably going to take losses. And to deal with an entire additional wave and escort without proper preparation is practically suicide. So not only does that extremely small force I mentioned need to be able to stay alive at all costs, but it also needs to pack enough firepower that we never sustain any more than four colonist deaths. Which is a little bit of a fucking problem, so it obviously needed to be an extremely specific force. So after a bunch of debating and a few, uh, workplace incidents, I assembled my force which is going to be four war pigs, a single hammer security, and two medics, which combines for a total supply of 10, which assures we can have nine SCVs either constantly gathering minerals or building up structures, which, again, needed to be min-maxed. So afterwards, we finally utilized our newly unlocked upgrade, the Shrike Turret, the main reason why we bought it is it finally gives us the ability to spend resources on something that can actually deal damage and help us. It's not a whole lot of damage, it's actually insanely low, but god damn it, we needed to build bunkers anyways and it's something. Literally anything. But uh, this is such a peculiar mission that we actually can't just stop at salvaging the bunker in order to optimize our spending. Now we also need to optimize our fucking walls. So now the game plan consists of building NG bays, but actually stopping the construction at 99%, cancelling it, and then once the building gets to low health we actually fully cancel it and build it again. Just like our bunker micro, but uh... Surprisingly way worse and way more tedious. Again, every mineral needs to be optimized. Not only do we need to optimize our bunkers, not only do we need to optimize our NG bays, not only do we need to optimize our SCVs, not only do we need to optimize our army, not only do we need to optimize our army movement and micro, but we need to do all this simultaneously. And if one single step fails, everything begins to fall apart. So, this was pretty difficult, but luckily, by kind of front-loading all the pain and micro that we have to go through, by the fourth convoy we actually have enough resources available that we can begin to play pretty recklessly. Building tons upon tons upon tons of bunkers, and then by the final wave we can actually begin to sack off our SCVs to get more war pigs or hammer securities. Once you get all of it set up, it's actually a pretty simple finish. 
Of course, you should still be microing your bunkers when applicable, but even assuring you can get to this simple finish is a massive chore and a half, and one I did not enjoy. And on the next mission, for a very immediate stark contrast to the last mission, I needlessly prolonged it by an excessive amount of time because I told myself I didn't need to beat this mission with Reapers. I didn't need to fall back on the very blatantly optimal army comp, and I could do some cool building strats with well-placed bunkers and specific units and upgrades and play this like fucking Frostpunk. And was this a good demonstration? Maybe. I'm a bit biased, I'm going to admit, but was this a great way to deal with the structures? No. And since the enemy infested do actually gain upgrades over time, by minute 40 or so, I was actually in a ton of trouble as they were getting more upgrades than me, and I began to sustain a ton of damage. So, I made Reapers. If you don't know, Reapers completely turn this mission upside down. Not only do they do a ton of damage against the infested that come out during the night, but during the day, they completely obliterate enemy structures. And when combined with their massive move speed increase, yeah, you can do some wacky damage with them. And obviously, since the infested come out of the infested structures that you destroy, they have a very exponential effect. Because the more they kill, the less they have to kill. Which makes killing much easier, which in turn means there's less to kill. So there's not really a whole lot of reason to not use them, unless you're a prideful bastard who wants to prove to society that you can do it without them by playing a fucking city simulator, but alas, I was not able to. Afterwards, though, we finally gained enough Zerg research to get our Perdition turret. Firstly, it should be pretty obvious, but we're not going to get the Planetary Fortress since we kind of can't build CCs, and using our main base offensively would be... suicide, at best. But Perdition turrets fill in that previously described niche that the Shrike turret fulfilled earlier, but immensely better. They can't be salvaged, but for 50 extra minerals, you're getting an infinitely better attack, and one that's AoE, mind you, and an extremely useful ability to burrow outside of combat, which not only makes its longevity better, but it also makes its offensive capabilities better, as you can actually combo this with other structures to make them both even more lethal. Remember the NG Bay walls and how we would utilize them with bunkers to minimize damage? With Perdition turrets, we can do a version of that, but with the intention of maximizing damage. You can force enemies to walk up to your bunker to try and do damage, but before they're able to fully close the distance to do damage to it, there is now a massive fuck-off flamethrower burning them alive as well as all the damage that the bunker, or maybe even the missile turret, is doing alongside it. And it's a very nasty combo. The Perdition turret is just an amazing upgrade, and one we will utilize constantly throughout the entire run. And the next mission, Welcome to the Jungle, is a great example of this new combo. Firstly, we're going to be throwing in the missile turret into the mix here, as we can go ahead and unlock their splash damage upgrade, which kind of makes them OP. Namely, their interaction with armor in this game. Seven attacks of one always guarantee seven damage, which in larger numbers can be absolutely insane. And no joke, in any mission where there is a prevalent air threat, missile turrets do a great job of just completely nullifying them. So that's two massive power spikes for us, and you're going to see them both in action on this mission. Building up and utilizing defensive positions here and here, we can safely secure six out of the seven altars that are required. And trust me, we do need to secure those areas, as the longer the mission goes on, the more and more scary the attack waves and their upgrades are. And that is really not great for us. In fact, there's a conceivable time frame in which the buildings can no longer comfortably sustain against the attack waves. 
which is about 25 to 27 minutes into the mission. Since the Protoss forces are constantly advancing in tech, upgrades, forces, and the actual numbers that they're sending out, this is roughly the length where, if we don't have a way to ensure that we can beat the mission at that point, we can't. We just lose. So our timer was set for 27 minutes. And one thing that is very important to note is that we do need the research here, and the two that are remaining are on complete poor opposite sides of the map. Generally, my solution to this would be sending in my command center to fly over it and get the remaining research, but... The Terrazine that we gather needs to be turned in into a command center, and obviously if we just suicide it in... We die. We can't build another one, we don't have one, GG. So instead, I had to micro my very minimal forces, and... That took a fair few retries. Like, this research over here is deceptively hard to get. As sad as it is to say, just a constantly reinforcing wave of 3 to 4 zealots is just way too much for us. But eventually, I was able to make it work. And in the meantime, I made this massive fuck-off turret setup near the last two canisters, and my SCVs were able to gather it in... Relative peace considering? No joke, they were in range of multiple units, and some of them should have just attacked him. I kind of can't stress enough how lucky this is. In most scenarios, this would have been a reload, but I just kind of lucked out here. But either way, with the Tauderim's extreme prejudice against missile turrets showing in full force here, I was able to gather the last two Terrazine and move on to the next mission. I guess to briefly mention it, I did go with vanadium plating instead of ultra capacitors. Firstly, I'm just going to shorten them to VP and UC because... God, saying them over and over and over again in a paragraph is just kind of shitty. But usually UC is slightly preferable over VP, and that's for a fair few reasons. Firstly, there are just some units that inherently benefit from it much more. Say, for example, the Siege Tank, or the Ghost, which are both units that should realistically never be taking damage. And that also applies to units in bunkers, or otherwise just units in defensive positions. Also, especially by the time you get to Char, just the sheer prevalence of Zerg melee units heavily encourages offense over defense. Because, sure, you may be able to tank an extra Ultralisk attack or two if you have plus three armor, but it's really not unrealistic to suggest that with the added attack speed, your units may have just been able to kill the Ultralisk before it actually got to them and inherently take no damage from it. So, usually UC is slightly preferable. However, I went with VP, just because I wanted to prioritize the early game a bit more than usual, and I think the added health and bulk was just a tad bit more helpful than usual in this playthrough. I digress though. On to the next mission, I tried to do the Great Train Robbery and... Nah, it's just not really doable. It's mostly doable, but the second the Marauder kill teams are sent out, everything just goes to hell. We just don't have access to any good upgrades or units that would really take them on. And avoiding them is just flat out not an option. Short term? Yeah, sure, but eventually their pathing will inevitably intertwine with the trains and... If we can't kill the Marauder kill teams on their own, we're sure as hell not going to be able to kill them, and the train, and possibly the train's escorts simultaneously. If we had better burst, Maybe, but currently that's just not in our toolkit, so instead, we're going to go ahead and do the dig. So, yet again on this mission, we had to do more shenanigans with NG bays and turrets. But here's the thing. This mission in particular, we had to delay a ton, because pretty much the only way we were going to beat it is if we kill priority targets every single time they showed up. Early game, it's Archons and Immortals, and 
Although later on we actually don't have to worry about Archons anymore, Immortals are still a very real threat and Quasi are just as terrifying. So although playing through this mission firsthand was massively stressful because every mineral wasted was a mineral we were just never going to see again due to our inability to reasonably take a second base, I actually just don't have a whole lot to add, as miraculously, the timing was near perfect, and although I didn't have a mineral to my name at the end, we actually microed the drill well enough that we could just sack off everything we had to ensure our victory. And yeah, sure enough, by the end, we were able to win with our base completely overran. If the massive enemy onslaught came any sooner than the literal last few seconds of the mission, we would have just been dead. There was no coming back from this. However, Blizzard was actually with us, and with this victory, we can now do the Zeratul mission. A uh, key thing to note there, mission, not mission Z. Although it is actually possible to beat this mission on lower difficulties, on Brutal, yeah, try to micro six probes against an entire Protoss base, it's not going to work out. But with all the research we got on the first mission, we did get a new tier of upgrades with Orbital Depots or Microfiltering. As much as I would absolutely adore to pick Orbital Depots, that is one of those moves that, although slightly humorous, would probably just result in trolls accusing me of being a fraud and a hack and... Although there is a 100% viable way to tell at any given moment whether or not I cheated, I don't know if I want to give them the ammunition, so instead, we're just going with microfiltering. Anyways, here's Nova's fun time adventure. The difference between ghosts and specters in this playthrough is pretty much completely negligible. I can say in retrospect that the specter might have been slightly preferable, as I never really utilized the ghost snipe ability, but... By the end, either way, I'm going to be using this unit as a walking nuke launcher, so I went ahead and went with Nova because I think the mission is a little bit more fun. That's kind of just it. However, after doing this, we get a bunch of credits, and we can buy some more vital upgrades. And at this stage in the playthrough, there are four units in particular we really need upgrades for. And that's the SCV, the Command Center, the Siege Tank, and the Ghost. All of which will come with time, and I will elaborate upon them very soon, but for now, we're going with the Ghost for the next mission, the Mobius Factor. So, as always, there's a really easy cheese you can do with the Siege Tank, or really any long-range unit to instantly kill the first and second data core extremely easily, which leads exclusively the third one. And for that, we're going Ghost. So Ghosts have an upgrade that you can purchase which reduces the energy required to use their cloak ability by 100%. So imagine a Dark Templar with a higher vision range that has a ranged attack instead of a melee attack that can call down nukes in a PvE format where you inherently know where detectors can or cannot be. Yeah, that's a little bit busted. So with this newfound upgrade, we can actually just dogpile in a few ghosts into a medevac, kill any detectors that may be near the Brutalisk or the last objective, which gives us complete reign to nuke anything on the map repeatedly with absolutely no retaliation. I mean, it takes a few nukes, but that's not really a tall order with the god unit that is the Siege Breaker. And with our few SCVs on repair and gather duty, we just AFK'd until we made enough nukes to inevitably win. And pretty much on that exact note, the next mission will be pretty much the exact same. We got the Orbital Command here, which not only lets us mine a lot more efficiently with mules, since they're free and they also cost no supply, but the scan ability is going to be extremely useful in admittedly pretty niche scenarios, but there's enough niche scenarios that I kind of struggle to really confidently call it niche. So anyways, here's the plan on this mission. 
The first infestation that spawns can actually be killed off pretty easily with your starting vikings and a little bit of micro. So if you manage to get it down, that means you don't have to deal with the infested attacking your base. So what this allows you to do is make a small battalion of ghosts, a few ghost academies, and about a... a billion nukes. Because one fantastic attribute about this mission is when a settlement is getting infested, if you kill the virophage, you don't actually really need to worry about the units that are protecting it. The AI doesn't send out the Broodlords, or the Mutas, or any of the other extremely scary units your way, and in fact the only units you have to worry about are the few weak civilians or marines that spawn in the process. So with this, you can casually nuke every virophage in existence, and since it's a structure, it'll take the full 500 damage, and rather conveniently enough, a virophage that is morphing will have anywhere between 200 and 500 health. So all I have to do is send a few ghosts throughout the map, and whenever a zerg tries to infest a settlement, just send it there and nuke it down, get thanked for quote-unquote saving them, Mineral field depleted. Now what? I knew Raider'd save us! We'd all be dead with us. You sure about that? And as long as you do this, with only a few defensive structures, you literally never have to worry about your base, and you can kind of just nuke everything until you inevitably win. Or alternatively, as long as you can ensure that there are no detectors nearby, although it will take a while as the ghost's auto-attack damage is pretty low, they will eventually kill everything on the map and you can spare some resources. Although it doesn't really matter as, again, very little is sent after your base so it's pretty easy to actually float off your command center to an expansion if need be. Is this a rather mundane and droll strategy? Maybe, but is it effective? Absolutely. Afterwards, we gain access to another research node, and we go ahead and unlock the automated refineries, which is going to be absolutely massive for us, as that allows us to save an extra three SCVs per refinery, and inherently three supply, but it also allows us to gain resources outside of our main base, which is something we just weren't really able to do before. Yeah, I know it's possible for us to fly our command center over to get more resources, but the key thing to note is that supply depots are not expendable. And if an attack wave comes in and kills them, we're probably just going to die to attrition. So anytime it might be valuable for us to move a command center, we not only have to account for the defense of the forward command center, but we also have to account for the defense of our starting buildings, which just isn't always feasible, especially if we're relying on an immobile army. Other than that though, we're actually able to purchase our second siege tank upgrade, and that allows us to do the great train robbery again. Remember how I said ultimately that the Marauder kill team was the thorn in my side in this mission? Yeah, they kind of just don't get to exist with the siege breakers. In case you don't know, the siege breakers are pretty much universally agreed upon to be the most powerful unit in Wings of Liberty. I had a really cool paragraph here talking about the mercenary scalings and the upgrades and all that jazz, but really? Nothing I could say could really put it into words just how much damage they deal. So instead, here's a clip of how the confrontation with the Marauder Kill Team goes. The train is approaching through a tunnel in the middle of this. A train is coming through the western tunnel. Go on. At the ready. Yeah. And keep in mind with their extremely casual 170 base damage, they just completely decimate the trains as well. Which made the late game an absolute joke. It wasn't even possible for me to spend the resources I was gathering at this point because I was killing literally everything without a single death. So, 
The Great Train Robbery transformed from a nearly impossible mission that required immense amounts of micro to even attempt, to haha, Siegebreaker go brrrrrrrr. And with that victory, we gained access to a new research choice, and with that, we went ahead and chose the cellular reactor. And really as much as I love this upgrade and think it's a massive boon for our energy units, which are kind of our main units we're going to be using for the rest of the run, I do have to conceive that pretty much the main reason I did choose it was the fact that it wasn't regenerative biosteel. Which, despite this upgrade sounding incredible on paper, numerically it's just completely awful. For example, the Jackson's Revenge, without upgrades it's gonna take a casual, uh, 19 minutes to repair? And to compare that with the SCV, with the repair upgrade that we're about to unlock, yeah, I think we can go ahead and spare some SCVs. Afterwards, though, we can begin the next mission, Cutthroat. Cutthroat was yet another victim to the incomprehensible power of nuclear devastation. Ghosts are already immensely good here, as Orwin doesn't deploy any detector units, instead opting into using missile turrets, which, uh... aren't the most lethal units against ghosts, admittedly. And after you take care of those, there's nothing available that could possibly intervene against your onslaught. And with Orwin's three bases destroyed, he essentially gets no minerals. And when combined with his admittedly not very good attack waves, means we have virtually infinite time to beat the mission. However, with our ghosts being used proactive enough to take out most of Orwin's bases pretty early on, we can just go ahead and, uh, win. If you don't know, although it is a bit trickier than just going about it the normal way, if you go ahead and kill the planetary fortress, you don't have to worry about the contract objective whatsoever. And since ghosts can nuke the planetary fortress down here with vision, when combined with the orbital command scan ability, and the fact that the nuke inherently does increase structure damage, yeah, we can just go ahead and win in one fell swoop. In fact, doing this actually completely breaks the cutscene. What's supposed to happen is that the Planetary Fortress is supposed to survive with low HP to illustrate Orwin's surrender, but we actually did enough damage to execute it in range for it to avoid that threshold, so... Rest in peace, bozo. Anyways, the next mission on the chopping block is Supernova which I won't really cover too much because it's essentially a freebie. With the mission design, you're given 200 supply to start with, which means our only real limitation here is that we can't make multiple CCs, and I'm kind of more than fine with that, seeing as there's no reason to build anymore on this mission. So to make this easy on us, I did my classic cheese right here, utilizing this position to kill the artifact vault with pretty much no resistance. We do have to go ahead and place down a structure to avoid the defeat condition of losing all of your buildings, but admittedly that's not a huge issue. And setting this up is even easier than usual because we have the oh-so-fantastical Hercules, which only really has a few niche usages, but in those niche scenarios it is actually a pretty good... Oh. Uh... Pfft. Yeah, I genuinely didn't realize this until I got to scripting, but when I build a structure here to assure that I don't lose after my main base gets burnt to a crisp, I kind of just defaulted to building a supply depot. And I guess to be fair it is still in line with the challenge as we do already have 200 supply, but luckily for us, I did save a few points before this just to assure I could pull this strategy off, so I went ahead and loaded that back up built an engineering bay instead of defaulting to a supply depot, then we can just go ahead and beat the mission the same exact way. Target firing the main objective, attacking the very few units that aggro onto us by doing this, GG easy, engine of destruction. Yet again, it's time for more cheese. We trap the Odin right here with a strategy I won't cover in depth for the trillionth time, but TLDR, as long as the Odin doesn't gain vision of an enemy here, it will never leave. 
So as long as we can maintain a forward perimeter, we're all set to stall for as long as we need. So the main reason we did this is to rush our 3-3 upgrades. Because the attack waves that are sent out, and please do not quote me on this, this is just an estimated guess, are based on what base you attacked and how far you've progressed with the main objective. So assuming we just sit here and never go after the third or fourth or god forbid even the fifth base until we get 3-3, the attack waves are just completely abysmal and yet again, Siegebreaker go brrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Nukes went burr. Afterwards, we move on to the final planet of the game, Char. Starting with the Gates of Hell, it is worth noting that we can also use Orbital Strike here to beat the mission almost instantly... again? But doing it twice in a row is pushing my luck, so instead, we're going to do it the more traditional way. And by the more traditional way, I mean literally just the traditional way because this is the second mission in the campaign where we start with 200 supply. Hence our only limitation is the inability to make another CC. Which isn't exactly the most impossible restriction to bypass. Even if we somehow did start with like 40 supply and needed to get up to 100, we could just go ahead and abuse the hive mind emulator here. So, I didn't mention it when we got to the Zerg research, but the Hive Mind emulator completely trivializes Char. I'm going to get more in depth with that in just a second, but the point I want to try and make is that, for whatever reason, although the mind controlled units don't cost any supply, for the mission objective they do, which means we could have just abused that if need be. However, just like I said, we start the mission with 200 supply, so we just beat the mission in the standard way. Get a big army, F2A move the main objectives, GG easy. But uh... For the last missions, yeah, the hive mind emulator is just completely broken. As it turns out, a tower that permanently mind controls Zerg at no cost, on missions where you're usually defending against an infinite wave of Zerg or attacking Zerg, is pretty good. So at this point, if you're looking for the answer for the title, yes. However, that's also really boring, so instead, I'm going to try and figure out how many units I need to make to win, because I'm also going to concede that 140 plus starting supply isn't that big of a limitation either. Although I am going to go ahead and replace the Hive Mind Emulator with the Psy Disruptor. Since I've never beaten a mission with it, it is a tech choice that I can go back and retroactively change, which can't be said for really any of the other choices. Also, if you're curious on the missions before All In, you either do your standard hero mission, but more specifically for this playthrough, since we want to go ahead and do the Nidus route, we just went ahead and beat this mission with orbital strikes and nukes. Not really a difficult endeavor. So on all in, firstly I do need to say I didn't kill off my starting forces for a bit, so we're not including that as a factor. To find out the minimum supply you need to beat the mission with, you need to account for three things in particular. Killing off the constant wave of ground forces that come in, killing off the Nidus worms that emerge all over the map, and killing off Kerrigan every time she attacks your base. The easiest of these three is by far the Nidus worms. If you can keep your Duskwings alive, you only need about 9 to 12 supply dedicated to that, with obviously 3 to 4 Duskwings. This is definitely the part that requires the most micro though, as if you lose a Duskwing, or alternatively just don't kill the Nidus Worms in a timely manner, you're probably just going to lose. For Ghosts, that number is also subjective, but as long as you can bait out Kerrigan's Razor Swarm, I think you can get as low as about 15 Ghosts. Okay, so real quick, Future Davy is breaking in. I did a few runs of this after editing, and found out some things I said, although not incorrect, could be refined. So to go ahead and quickly revise what I was saying, for Kerrigan you 100% need ghosts in order to kill her in a timely sense. And against the ground army, you definitely need your siege breakers and preferably one or two siege tanks per side. However, by far the biggest change is I suggested 30 SCVs. But you can actually go as low as 10 to 15 after you get a stockpile up and running pretty comfortably. And since you shouldn't be spending money on army units after you get your forces up, this should just come naturally anyways. And another pretty big one is for the medics. I originally thought that they were mandatory because of Kerrigan's Razor Swarm. However, after some more tinkering with structures, I found that just having a singular offensive structure up here 
Alongside the Psy Disruptor, Kerrigan Razor Swarms that instead of your forces. And if you have enough Perdition turrets on the low ground, she will also Razor Swarm those instead of the Ghosts. And for the Dusk Wings and Siege Tanks, I noticed that two Siege Breakers and one Siege Tank is more than capable of taking on every attack wave as long as your Dusk Wings are doing their thing. In fact, if you're really good at controlling them, you might not even need a third Siege Tank. So instead of my original 90 estimation that I thought was rather min maxi with room for improvement, I was able to comfortably beat this mission with as low as 70 to 80 supply. Although I am going to concede, my RNG was actually just impeccable here. Nidus Worms were very rarely outside of range of the Nova, and the few that did spawn there were extremely easy to pick off and I very rarely actually got into any confrontations with Hydras or Overseers in the entire mission. Also, the enemy AI was just... not having it that day? This should have been a loss, but they just wanted to ignore me for whatever reason. I can't be upset, but it's jarring to say the least. However, even after all of this, I think there was still room for optimization. For example, I noticed I made a few extra ghosts I didn't need, and made a few extra SCVs near the end that just ended up not doing anything. So I want to say it's probably pretty likely that a sub-65 supply run is possible with the rules on screen. Anyways, everything I say after this is pretty standard, so let's go ahead and go back to past Davy. So... Yeah, is it possible to beat Wings of Liberty without increasing your supply? Yeah. And honestly, it was pretty fun. Barring a few notable exceptions, I really enjoyed this through and through. So, uh... I do need to do a sequel prompt here because obviously this is the first campaign, and the next two videos are coming soon. Assuming they're not already released right now. And I also have to do my standard outro. So if you're interested in Heart of the Swarm or Legacy of the Void, feel free to check the description to see if they exist yet. Or alternatively, just click on my channel and see if they're uploaded. As perfectly as the YouTube call to action fits here, these both should be uploaded in a day or two at most, so... I trust your judgment on that. On to the Patreon shenanigans, I'm not exactly the next Eminem, but I am going to say all the patrons' names as fast as possible because all of you are going to have a lot of glory over the next few days. Parabell, Maiden, Jacob S, Michael P, Droopy, Breadman, Catapult Man 1, Chair, Judge and Jury, Wub Kitten, Scarner, Crystal, and Teddy Bear Guy, Cray, Mr. Sauces, Mr. Bones, Pyro Musical, No Goat, Blaze Heart, and Angus JS. Although I won't, uh elegantly wrap your names like this constantly, if you have a desire to have your name read aloud in an extremely monotone voice, exclusive bug videos, or MS Paint drawings such as these disasters, feel free to click the link in the description or on screen. Anyways, hope you're having a wonderful day, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye bye